Okay, people are slowly dropping in from lunch. Um, I think it's about time to get started. Yeah, okay. Um, welcome here, everyone, um, to the session about how to build a scalable platform for today's publishers, um, presented under the site building uh, track. So, uh, what are we going to do here today? First of all, I'm going to introduce myself, talk a little bit about the project that I'm currently working at. Um, we're also going to uh, walk through some of the common requirements that you bump, bump into building uh, sites for publishers um, today. Uh, some common requirements, not specifically you know, tied to Drupal, uh, but common requirements on a CMS for publishers today. Um, then we're going to touch on why Drupal is the right tool for these kind of sites. And we're going to dive a little bit deeper into what modules uh, we've been using to solve some very particular problems um, uh, around certain areas. And in the end, I'm going to give a short uh, demonstration of uh, some of the uh, modules that we've been using. Okay, first me, um, Dick Olsson. Uh, I currently live in Doha, in Qatar, uh, right in the middle of the desert uh, in the Middle East. Um, I'm the lead Drupal developer at Al Jazeera, the TV channel, uh, leading all their Drupal sites uh, and so on. I'm currently on a leave of absence uh, from Node1. It's a, a Drupal consultant in Sweden. Um, I'm also a very active core contributor. Uh, I also work on a lot of contrib contributed modules, among them uh, being UUID and uh, Deploy. Okay. So, um, a time ago, Al Jazeera um, started adopting Drupal for a lot of their uh, sub sites smaller sites, smaller projects. Uh, and they did so to, in order to be able to move a little bit faster on the web, to deploy projects, to reach the audience a little bit faster. Uh, one of the sites that was built was blogs.aldasera.com, uh, a site that tur turned out to be very important uh, during the Arab revolutions that we've seen uh, the past year here. Uh, it allowed the editors to reach audience faster, live blogging, and so on. Um, unfortunately, uh, due to uh, internal reorganizations, Al Jazeera is not ready to deploy Drupal for Al Jazeera.com yet. Um, but we're definitely in the process. And um, so the platform that we've been building for Al Jazeera, um, at Al Jazeera, um, we're scaling that, uh, we're benchmarking that, and we're testing that um, to match the requirements of Al Jazeera.com, and we want to build a generic and good platform. And just to give you an idea, uh, sort of what we're benchmarking against and what we're working on, um, we have about 50 web editors um, at Al Jazeera. Around 30 articles or pieces are published every day. It contains uh, news articles, opinion pieces, uh, program packages, etc. And uh, all in all, you can, you can roughly say it's around 60 to 100 nodes a day, including all references and, and so on. So it's, it's not a large number, but still quite substantial. And we have editors working in two shifts, so they are constantly working on, on the CMS, on um, the, the staff. And on the other side, uh, average, we have about 60 million requests per hour hitting Al Jazeera.com. Um, and during spikes, around 50 million requests per hour. That's about 14,000 requests per second, quite substantial numbers. Um, again, this is currently not a Drupal site, but this is what we're scaling and testing for. Um, Blogs.aljazeera.com is what is running Drupal right now, and we're in the process of upgrading to Drupal 7. So just to give you an idea of what we're sort of benchmarking for. Okay, 
uh, some of the requirements, not uh, necessarily you know, tied, uh, tightly to uh, Al Jazeera, but uh, some common requirement, requirement, requirements that you often run into. First of them, being the platform that you're aiming for to choose uh, should really support agile development. It should really support the process that your editorial team is working under, which is a very iterative uh, process. Um, so the platform really needs to be able to support that um, and so that the development team can work in the same type of cycles. Uh, and also web publishing itself is constantly evolving. Uh, new technologies come out every day. You need to be very fast. You need to have a platform that allows you to stay on the edge. Um, because time to market is crucial for publishers. Um, you need to have a platform that quickly allows you to get something out there, uh, reach the market fast, and then uh, iterate on top of that. So you can build prototypes very fast and so on. So that's the first requirement. Second one, being a little bit more obvious maybe for publishers, we really need to have a system that supports efficient workflows. Uh, it needs to support the editor's daily work, of course. Um, it's a quite tricky one because organizations work very, very differently. Um, as well as sections within organizations. Uh, taking Al Jazeera as, ex as an example, the news desk works very differently compared to, for, for instance, the program department, workflows and so on. So puts, some real, um, puts the platform to some real challenges in configuring a very good workflow and so on. Um, Third requirement, content freshness. Uh, what do I mean by that? It's basically the time it takes from when a publisher clicks publish until we reach the first uh, impression from our audience, from our visitors. Um, it's, it sounds a uh, simple problem to solve, but it's actually not that obvious for all the systems. Many systems, CMS sits on application server behind corporate firewalls. A um, lot of workflows, generating HTML pages, pushing it up to servers when a new article goes out. Um, lots of different caching layers. We have content delivery networks. We have reverse proxy caching uh, as well in some cases. Um, and it's not uh, always just instant publishing. Um, we need to reach the audience fast with new pieces of content because uh, minutes really makes a difference on the social web. Um, Breaking with your story, you know, a minute, two minutes before your competitors can really make a difference in driving traffic um, to your site. So we need to be able to reach uh, audience fast without, you know, minutes of cache delays and so on. Because uh, again, being first is really vital. And sort of to stem demonstrate the, uh, this, um, for a large-scale Drupal site, it's not very uncommon that you have very many layers of caching. At the bottom, you have your Drupal database, of course. You have static caching in line in PHP. You have the Drupal cache API. On top of that, you have varnish, reverse pro proxy caching. And even in some cases, you have an additional layer with a content delivery network even in front of varnish. And getting all these uh, layers of caching to play well together uh, can be a real challenge. And um, editors, don't, they don't want to sit around waiting you know, three, four minutes before they're uh, articles, you know, reach their audience before they can tweet a link to their article. Um, so this is a really important requirement. Scalability. Um, it's really important when your story breaks, when your story gets out there, it's really important that your site stays up, uh, obviously. Um, otherwise, you won't be able to have the impact on your audience that you want to have. I can again take Al Jazeera as, as an example. Um, breaking with stories during the Arab Revolution, during the Arab Spring, if the site wouldn't have stayed up, I'd, I'm not sure that Al Jazeera would have had the impact um, during you know, those critical times when stories were breaking. So the system really needs to be scalable to support these traffic spikes you know, when visitors are hitting your site. Another challenge is that when the traffic spikes are the highest, 
your editors are going to require the cache time to be the shortest. Uh, again, taking Al Jazeera as, as an example, uh, when Gaddafi was captured during the Libyan revolution, they were updating articles, you know, once every minute, twice every minute with uh, corrections, more facts, and so on. Um, so they really want to tune down the cache times when the spikes are uh, as the highest on your, on your site. And security. You can never forget about that. Um, online activism is, you know, uh, constantly um, increasing, uh, and trust is, in, ex is extremely important for uh, publishers' brands today. Uh, being compromised, being hacked, hurts your brand, obviously, very much. And looking at it from the other side, information leakage from your CMS system could potentially jeopardize people's lives. Um, having source information, having um, references to people, where you get the sources from, if that information is leaking out, there are organizations and governments that could do bad things to these people, you know, if sources are leaking out. So um, uh, source notes taken in the revision logs and so on. Um, so potentially could you know be very very dangerous. So security of the system is obviously obviously very important. And why is Drupal the right tool then? Reflecting back on the requirements here that we just went through, agile development. Um, Drupal has a lot of ready-to-use modules, as I'm sure um, everyone here knows. Uh, we can reach market fast. We can build prototypes very fast, um, and then iterate on top of that. Efficient workflows has been one of the weak points in Drupal for a long time. Uh, recently picked up a lot of good momentum in the community. A lot of good modules uh, has been released, solving uh, a lot of the issues. Um, a lot of good work is also happening in Drupal 8. But we're going to look at some of the modules here for Drupal 7 on how we choose to solve this. Content freshness, um, again, Drupal is a one-click publishing uh, CMS a little bit. You click save, and your article goes to the front page. So uh, by nature, Drupal is good at solving the content freshness thing. But as I demonstrated, still have many layers of caching that we sort of need to deal with. Um, scalability. Drupal 7 got a lot more scalable. A little bit slower, but a lot more scalable. Um, the new da database API, uh, master slave replication, better support for that, um, pluggable field storage, better cache implementations. Uh, we have Q API, uh, we have entity field query, a lot of, a lot of new APIs that really uh, help to scale your platform uh, in new ways. And being a very uh, popular, very tested CMS Drupal is also very secure. Uh, not only its code is secure, but Drupal is also secure by process. Uh, Drupal has a very well-defined process of how to deal with um, security holes, security patches, and so on. Uh, something that not all the other open source CMSs has. So I would say the biggest strength in Drupal is that Drupal is secure by process. All software has security holes. All software will uh, you know, expose security holes at some point. Unfortunately, that's the reality of programming. Um, so it's very important that we have a secure process on how to deal with security holes. And this is really where Drupal shines with its uh, security advisory team. Okay, give me the modules. How do we do this? And I'm going to fall back onto these requirements as I walk through the modules why we should like, choose particular modules and how that, those correlate to the requirements that we are running into. First module being Workbench, or actually Workbench Core and Workbench Moderation. Workbench is a suite of modules, um, provides easier content management, uh, easier ways to deal with your content, to deal with revisions, and so on. And with Workbench moderation, it's easier to set up flexible workflows um, around your content. And it provides much better coherence for your editors. Drupal out of the box is a little bit scattered for content uh, authors um, in how, how they deal, how they find content, how they filter, and so on. Workbench provides much better coherence. 
um, through some, something called My Workbench. It's essentially a dashboard, um, a home for your editor, where they will find the most crucial information um, around the content that they are currently working at or that other people in their team is working at. I'm going to give you a demonstration of these modules that I'm working through later on. Workbench moderation. Um, we can assign different workflow states to our content. Um, and this is very flexible. You can configure these as you, as you go. Um, and also the revision management. We can have a published revision out on the site. And we can work on a new draft for this. The green one here being published already. The red one is something that we're currently working on. Not something that Drupal Core is very good at. So Workbench and Workbench moderation exposes and provides this functionality. Really, really helpful. <laughs> so why Workbench then? Um, unique workflows per content type. Um, unique workflows per role. It's really, we can be really agile and we set up everything here. And we've noticed that sections within our organizations map very well to content types. Uh, news desks are mostly publishing the news content type. We can set up workflows for that. The program department is working on their program packages and so on. So we can really be efficient with our workflows here and provide better coherence, uh, as I mentioned. Next module, uh, deploy. A uh, module that I'm the maintainer for and uh, that I've been writing during my time at Al Jazeera for Drupal 7. It's essentially a framework for pushing content from your Drupal site to another system. Can be another Drupal site, can be an arbitrary system of any kind. You can set up this to be automated or manual. Uh, and deploy is many times used to set up something called content staging. Basically, you're separating your editorial site with your public site, where editors are sitting and editing content, previewing, reviewing content on your editorial site, and then pushed to the public site when ready. Essentially, it looks something like this. You have your staging site, uh, often on a secure network, uh, behind corporate firewalls, so we can protect our revision logs, so we can protect unpublished contents. Um, and when they reach the uh, ready state, when they reach the published date, deployment is triggered uh, out, to the, out, to the, out to the production site automatically. <coughs> a simple screenshot over uh, a dashboard where you can see your, the, and manage your uh, deployment plans. Deployment plans being packages of content that is supposed to go out together at one time. We have two different plans here, for instance. Instant deployments are queued on a very uh, tight schedule. Weekend deployments and so on. Um, packages that goes out in the weekend. I'm going to demonstrate this again a little bit later. So why deploy then? So we can, we can separate our sites. We can actually deploy code and updates faster, uh, falling back on the agile development here. Uh, for instance, if a bug appears on our public site, we can fix that bug, and we don't need to run through the tests for all the editorial features and all the other features that are sit sitting on the editorial site. Because on the public site, we've stripped down, stripped down a lot of modules that we don't need because editors are not logged in there. So we can be much more accurate in fixing bugs, uh, deploying updates, and so on. We don't need to do as much quality assurance uh, and so on because there's less uh, code that we're touching when we're separating our two sites. So agile development. Uh, falling back to efficient workflows, we can set up transparent content staging. Um, editors don't really care if you know, the site is split up in, in, in two pieces, editorial and public. They just want to get their uh, content out there. Uh, and we can set, set up this to be automated, so the editors don't really, don't really know or don't really see if it's split up on two sites. And security. We can have our editorial site on a closed network, as shown in the graph before on the last slide. Um, also, by stripping down modules that we don't need on the pu public side, we have less code running, uh, at a decreased hit area, so to speak. 
less code that can uh, contain potential security holes and so on. Um, so it's, it's, you know, provides much better security as well. Next module, a new module that we've been working on at Al Jazeera. Um, it's basically a very lightweight wrapper for listing functionalities. It's called Entity List. We have very many different ways of listing and querying um, content uh, on a Drupal site. We have views, we have node queues, we have Apache Solar, we have Search API in some cases, Entity Field Query, and a bunch of other ways. They all work differently. They are all cached differently. They are all presented and themed differently. So entity list is essentially a very lightweight wrapper around this. And entity lists lives as contexts in your panels, for those of you that knows how panels works. And we unify the output by injecting this context into our panel panes, into entity panes. This makes it a unified output. We can optimize the output better. It's easier to theme. Uh, it's easier to cache. Because entity list knows more about what content that is actually in a view or in, uh, in your pane. Um, so it's easier to optimize. And we can also transparently switch query backends. For instance, if we have an entity list on our front page that is supported by a view, the, the backend handler for this entity list is a view and we're starting to run into maybe performance problems. We can transparently switch the handler for our entity list to, for, uh, for instance, an entity field query without changing our presentation layer at all. It's completely separated and dealt with in panels. So we can work more agile, we can work faster, and it provides better scal scalability by you know, being able to switch out query backends. And it also in integrates with uh, a new module called cache tags. And what is cache tags? Uh, cache tags is essentially backported functionality from Drupal 8. Uh, the cache tags API is not committed to Drupal 8, but we're working on it. And I've backported this to Drupal 7. And before I'm gonna walk into what it actually does, I'm gonna describe how it works today in many cases without using cache tags. So we take an example, we have node ID number one. We have node ID number one on the front page in a view. We have the node page itself. And we have another page somewhere else where node uh, ID number one is presented as a related article or something like that. We have three different cache entries. We have views cache in the first alternative. Uh, we have uh, entity cache. And we have maybe another view with the related articles with three di different cache entries to deal with. And since it's very complex to set up a good cache invalidation logic when an update is deployed, we, it's very hard to track where this node is appearing, what panes we should clear the cache on, what views we should clear the cache on, etc. We do like this, we say, I'm gonna cache this for five minutes. Because after five minutes, there might be an update to this node that we need to, uh, that we need to display. So we're only gonna cache for five minutes and then clear the cache. After five minutes, we might have an update, we might not have an update. Uh, so it's not a really a very efficient way of dealing with it. So what cache tags does is that we can tag every individual cache entry with more information than just the cache key for it. We can tag it with, for instance, node one. Uh, so all those three cache entries are tagged with node one, and when an update to this node is being deployed or is being published, we can just say invalidate everything with node ID number one that is tagged with node ID number one. And we can uh, very efficiently clear the caches on all the panes, on all the views, on all the entity caches and so on at once in a very efficient manner. So you can tag cache entries and you can also tag whole requests. So the varnish cache, for instance, the proxy, uh, the reverse proxy cache is living outside of Drupal. But we can say on this page, node ID number one, five, 12, and 32 lives on this page, it's presented on this page. 
It's very easy to do that because we have unified the output through panels and the panels caching mechanism can tell the page that these nodes exist on this page. So we tag this whole page with all these nodes. And again, when one of the nodes are being uh, updated, we can easily invalidate the cache in, in Varnish by sending uh, an invalidation command saying that all the pages containing node uh, number one should be invalidated. So what does the configuration look like? Some simple screenshots. It's very easy configuration to set up your entity list. We can choose what uh, query backend to use, entity field query, views, search API, etc. The lists are living as contexts in your panels. You add them as contexts. And in your panels interface, you inject them into either separate uh, entity panes or a pane containing all the lists. So we can set out item number one, two, three on our front page. We can set them with different view modes, uh, something that is not very easy to do with view sometimes. We can set full, full uh, node display on, on the first one and TC view on the second one, etc. This is all configurable. And the cache tags um, interface, it's for Drupal 7, it requires actually a patch to core, so you need to be aware of what you're doing. Um, but it basically adds another argument to your cache set where you can give an, a, an array of tags that you want to tag it with. You can tag it with the node, you can tag it with its author if you want the ability to invalidate everything that has with a specific author to do. And you can also tag requests with a separate function. And then it also provides a cache invalidate function where you pass in an array of tags that you want, want to invalidate. And it's inval invalidated across all the cache bins. OK, so why entities and cache tags? We can refactor faster with better separation using entity lists, as I described. Being more agile, we can deploy updates faster and so on. Transparently switch query backends for better scalability. I mentioned that already. And with integration between entity lists and cache tags, we have no more stale caches anymore. When our editors are deploying or publishing an update to a node, we will instantly invalidate that cache and it will instantly reach our audience. Editors don't need to sit around waiting for three minutes for their uh, update to reach our audience before we can tweet a link to our article, before we can reach faster than our competitors out there. So we can instantly invalidate. And the power here is that everywhere on the site it will be invalidated on related, uh, related article lists, on paints on the front page, on topic pages, and so on. So a very ultimate way of doing this. At the same time, we also get longer cache lifetimes. Because if we are not deploying or publishing an update to a node, we won't invalidate it after five minutes. So we actually have longer cache lifetimes when we need it. Uh, so it scales better, performs better. OK, so now on to the demo. Before I get started here, I'm just going to see how we make, how we do it in time here. I think it's pretty well. OK, so uh, I'm not able to show our Al Jazeera site that we're working on at the moment. So I've set up a very basic demonstration site here. We have a front page. We have two topic pages with some uh, very simple content types on. Um, Everything built up with panels and entities, as we showed here. First thing I'm going to show is the My Workbench. Basically, the dashboard I was talking about, giving editors an easier way to find and manage their content. We have a good overview here. And we can expand all the lists. We can filter it down, etc. And these are all powered by views, by the way. So you can easily change and optimize and add columns to your Workbench uh, views here. Uh, so what we're going to do now is we're just updating the title uh, of an article. And we're going to put this as needs review. We have options down at the bottom uh, where we can set this uh, article as needs review for other to review. At Al Jazeera, we have a very uh, well-working peer-to-peer reviewing. So everyone can review and everyone can um, publish, actually. It's... And going back to the workbench here, we can go to the needs review queue. 
where you will see all the uh, articles and pieces that needs to be reviewed. Um, so, assuming that I'm another uh, editor logging in on the site, I can go in, proofread this article, can read it through, and when I'm done, I can go to the uh, revision overview here. I can instantly publish the last draft that we've been working on directly from this interface here. And we'll see that the latest draft turns out green and it's published. Basically, the title is updated. Next, uh, next thing I'm going to show is the deploy module. So basically what we're doing here is that we're opening up our production site. Um, production site, I've made this red to separate the staging site and the production site to make it more clear. So what we're going to do now is that we're going to show you here the deployment overview um, sort of dashboard where you can manage all your plans manually if you want to. So here we have our two deployment plans. Our instant deployment plan doesn't contain any content at this point. And we can have an arbitrary number of plans with different workflows attached to them. So it's very flexible. Editing a plan, it's quite straightforward. All the different steps in a deployment is configurable. So how you collect your content, it could be a view, it could be collected manual. The deployment process itself is pluggable through Ctools plugins. You can queue it up with Queue API. You can use Batch API or directly in memory. And you can also configure your endpoints at the bottom here, as you see. Endpoints are basically the system that you're deploying to. In this case, it happens to be another Drupal site. It happens to be our production site. Um, configuring it here, we can configure what authentic authentication methods it's using. We're working on an OAuth plugin, and it's not completely done yet. So in this example, we're using session authentication, so we need to give the username and password for our production Drupal site. And an endpoint URL. Endpoint URL being URL basically to your services endpoint. It works with the services module. So here we now manually will add uh, this piece of content to our instant deployment plan. And going back to the overview here, we see that we now have one piece with an updated title, and we can deploy it directly from the interface here manually. And we get some good green messages here. That's a good sign. And updating the page here, we see that on the production site, uh, our title is now updated. A very simple example. Obviously, this is manual, and it doesn't work for all the editorial teams. Many editorial teams will have, want to have very manual control over this. But in our case, we are, have set up a transparent system where they don't know when it's deployed. Well, they do know, obviously, when it's published. But, and we can set up rules here, basically. It's full rules integration. So what we're doing here is that we are configuring the rules module. Here we have a rule triggering on after updating existing and new content. We can set some conditions. The, works, the, the transition should be to published state. And the action is to add a piece of content to a plan. We then have a separate rule where, with higher weight, that is uh, deploying the plan itself. So when we now go back to our workbench, update an article, put it to published, it's going to be deployed automatically to our uh, production site. updating the title and putting our piece here as published will now trigger the deployment automatically because we configured our rules here. We see some mes messages here. And walking over to the production site and updating, we see that the title was updated for those of you that saw that. Next demonstration, uh, moving forward quickly here, is the entity list. Um, module together with cache tags. Configuring an entity list is, as we saw on the screenshot, the screenshots before, very simple. We have a title for entity list, and we choose what handler to use here. In this case, we're using a view to support this entity list. Uh, we can configure our settings here. Um, going over to panels, we see here at our front page, front page panel, we have added our list 
as a context. It's purely uh, the data, the um, query of the data that lives as, as the context. The presentation is done with panes. So here we have our three panes, item number one, two, and three, for instance. And we can configure this to say that this is the list that we're going to use. This pane should use index one and this view mode. Again, there are panes to uh, present the whole, a whole entity list if we want to, but this can sometimes give you quite good flexibility in how you want to configure specific items in your lists. So this is now set up with entity list without cache tags, with the sort of uh, old way of dealing with caching. Uh, so when we go here, uh, we have an unpublished piece of content that we want to push out to our production site. We publish the content here. And when we walk over to the production site and updating the page, we see that we don't have any content. We have to wait before the content, before the cache is being cleared. No matter how many times we update here, we need to wait one minute before the article is published, before we can uh, link to the uh, site. And waiting another minute here, time elapsed, and our content is uh, out. Not a very good way. We need you know, faster publishing. So uh, now it's configured with um, cache tags. And looking at the uh, headers here, we see that this is a fully cached page in Varnish. We have two cache IDs in the headers, in the response headers for this page. And we also have cache tags here in the headers. We have a cache tag for the list and for the nodes existing on this page. Fully cached page at this point. So going back to the staging site now and doing an, uh, an update, and deploying that over to the production site will say that we need to invalidate all the caches for this particular node. And remember that this was a fully cached page that we saw on the production site. So saving here will trigger the deployment over to the production site. And updating the page here now will give us the, uh, the updated title instantly. We don't need to wait for cache times. Uh, and we have actively invalidated the cache in both varnish, in both uh, entity list, or in the pane, in the, pan in the panel. And this is a very simple example. It's only one, one uh, list here of content. We can have many different panes, and the content can appear in many different ways. And the next request is obviously a fully cached page, and it will live on forever until it needs to be cleared. We have longer cache lifetimes. Again, we see the cache tags here in the HTTP headers. So a very short and simple demo uh, showing some of the sort of strengths in these particular modules that we've been working with. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of more modules that you use on a publisher site. We have content locking, a very, very useful module. We use the media module, of course, a lot of WYSIWYG integrations. But those generally work very well out of the box. And these are sort of the modules that we've been working very hard on trying to solve some particular problems um, appearing in the requirements. So are we going to release all these modules? Yes, of course. Um, Al Jazeera has picked up on open source very well. We are working very actively in sort of building everything as generic as possible, releasing our solutions, getting help from the open source community, supporting and, and improving these modules. We're even looking into, um, or we have been building our platform as a distribution, and we're looking into releasing as much of it as possible as a distribution for the open source community. We're not ready with the project yet, but we will probably re release it as some sort of distribution later on for others to take on, for others to improve, and so on. So we're really excited about that. And that's about it. Uh, you can reach me on uh, drupal.org on Twitter. Uh, you can read my blog. Uh, I haven't put up the slide share link, <laughs> as you can see. Uh, I will do that. I will tweet about it later, so you can download the slides. And uh, questions? Anyone? 
Uh, please feel free to step up to the mic in the middle and uh, present yourself and uh, make sure to speak in the mic so it's recorded um, uh, for, for others to see later. Yes. Hi, Damien McKenna. Um, so the cache tags module looks like it's going to be uh, possibly one of the best caching engines right now in Drupal. Uh, do you have plans on uh, improving it to have, say, more functionality out of the box, um, to do more of the invalidation automatically? Because uh, right now it seems that it's kind of um, an extension for memcache, and then after that you have to do the rest yourself to do the invalidation yourself. Uh, yes, so uh, for those of you that are going to the cache tags project page, um, it's currently maintained by uh, Carlos. Uh, I've become the co-maintainer, and we've been working on a sandbox with a lot of contrib improvements, with cache tags, with panels, with node queue, uh, and a lot of other contributed modules, sort of out-of-the-box out support. And since I've become the co-maintainer very recently, we are going to uh, merge that into the main project. So yes, it's going to be a lot more better out-of-the-box uh, support. We heavily rely on this, so we are going to you know, add in functionality as we go uh, into the module. Uh, so it's very soon going to be released with much better contrib support, yes. Also, um, given your push to try and make it part of Drupal 8 as standard, um, and also some of the uh, kind of lo possible loosening of standards on what gets added to stable releases, have you thought of trying to push to get your patch into Drupal 7? Um, we've, it has been discussed in the, in the issue, uh, on, on the core issue. Um, I, don't, I, I am perfectly fine with providing a backported patch. I would love it, uh, to be honest. Um, but it's, a, it's a quite a big API change, um, although it, it would be backward compatible. Um, but yeah, that, that is something that we need to discuss. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Martin Rio, and uh, my question was, um, most of the times when I use Varnish, there is a time to live on pages. So I was wondering um, how uh, the, when you're expiring a tag, or when you're deploying, sorry, a content to production, how is the Drupal invalidating the Varnish entry uh, immediately? Um, so Varnish uh, has a, um, uh, command line interface or through Telnet and the Varnish module for Drupal allows you to send terminal commands directly to your to your Varnish servers um, to all of them at the same time so basically we're sending a terminal command to our Varnish servers the cache tag module takes care of that um, and invalidates all the Varnish entries based on uh, that header uh, we basically send in a regular expression saying invalidate everything containing node ID 1, for instance. Uh, so it's done with terminal commands through to the Varnish servers. Perfect. Yeah. And is that part of the cache tax module state, or is it part of a, the, the rule for pushing things to production? Um, so that, that is uh, provided, the terminal commands, the invalidation commands is provided by cache tags. And uh, then we have uh, contrib hooks in cache tag that says when a node is saved, invalidate. Uh, and so on. Uh, so, yeah, it's two pieces to it. Yeah. Hi, my name is Matthew. My voice is going out, so I apologize. Um, <laughs> I work for a media company, and um, we are currently stuck on D6. And uh, we're having a hard time leveraging um, Varnish with our cache times. Um, we're noticing like, like things like our home page. We're having a hard time um, when there's new content, um, basically refreshing the cache and stuff like that. Yeah. Is there any tips or tricks that you would say for a D6er that uh, could help us out, or should we just stop kicking a dead horse and go on D7? Uh, if I don't recall uh, wrong here, I think actually cache tags has a release for um, Drupal 6. I think Carlos has worked on that. I, I haven't been involved in that at all. We've been working on an improved version of the 7, a Drupal 7 version. but. Um, it might actually have a Drupal 6 release. I'm, I'm very sorry that I can't answer that to you right here, but look into that. I think it wouldn't be too hard to actually uh, provide, that, uh, provide that functionality for Drupal 6. So uh, there, is a, there is a release. Someone says here in the audience, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Hi. Um, with security being a requirement, um, I had a little bit of a conditional question. I remember saying about a month, month and a half ago, uh, Al Jazeera got hacked. Mm -hmm. um, 
I w of course, the news didn't distinguish, was it the Drupal side or was it the non-Drupal side? And I was just wondering, if it was Drupal, are there any uh, lessons that you learned from that? Uh, definitely. Um, it was a Drupal site, unfortunately. Um, but it was uh, what, do you, what you call social hacking, basically uh, password leaking out and someone just straightly logging into the, to the system there. So it was, wasn't very much technical that we could do in that point. Uh, it was solved very quickly though. Um, and the lessons learned from that because the Drupal 6 um, uh, site that is released at, at this point, their editorial uh, staff is logged on to the public site. In our Drupal 7 release, we're splitting these up. We only have editorial users on the staging site. And we don't have any user accounts except user ID number one on the public site with a very strong password, obviously, uh, very well protected. Uh, so that is definitely the lessons le lesson learned from, from that one, uh, splitting up the two sites. Um, definitely, yeah. All right, thanks. Thank you. I see that uh, Deploy uh, still just has a dev release. Can you maybe just speak to you about which parts of it are stable and working and which aren't? So uh, the core functionality in Deploy at this point uh, is, uh, I would say, uh, quite stable. Um, the, re uh, the reason why it's still in dev is that because we want to make some additions to the API um, before the release. This is something that we're going to work on uh, on the code sprint on Friday, and hopefully a first uh, alpha release will come out of that code sprint because we're very, very close to the release uh, for the first alpha. But if you know what you're doing, if you have an engineering team that can support you, uh, you can start using Deploy today. Uh, but you need to be, of, of course, aware of the challenges that you deal with uh, uh, building on a dev release of a module. Yeah. But it's very close to the release. What, what about UUID? Uh, UUID uh, has alpha releases. Uh, there are some uh, bugs that we very recently solved that was blocking a beta release. And uh, I'm probably going to roll the beta release on Friday as well here. So we're very close to a more stable UUID release as well. Great, thanks. Thank you. Do we have any more questions from the audience? Please feel free to step up to the mic. OK. I say thank you again. And uh, have a nice time here at DrupalCon. And don't forget to evaluate our sessions here. Thank you.